to um, yet another in our series of candidate interviews uh, with folks who have contested races in uh, the May 15th primary. And I have Art Robinson, who is one of five candidates uh, running as a Republican in the primary uh, for the seat currently occupied by Peter DeFazio. Mm -hmm. And so welcome to CTV. Well, thank you. And I guess to start things off, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Where'd, uh, where'd you come from? Well, I grew up in Texas, in the Gulf Coast of Texas. My uh -huh. dad designed petrochemical plants. Mm -hmm. And then I wanted to go to school at Caltech. So I came to California and graduated from Caltech. Then I got my graduate training at UC San Diego, and they put me on the faculty there. And later I was uh, working at Stanford in the same way. Mm -hmm. And then later than that, Linus Pauling and I founded a separate research institute together. Mm -hmm. About 1980, my wife was also a scientist. We worked together, and in 1980, we moved to Oregon because we wanted to raise our family on an Oregon farm. Mm -hmm. And so we moved. We found a farm near Cave Junction or near Grants Pass and uh, worked there. But tragically, she died in 1988. Mm. We helped. We were, the lab was very good. It's called the Oregon Institute of Science and Medicine, but some of our colleagues in major institutions helped us start it. But she died in 88, and at that time we had children in ages one and a half to 12, mm. six. So that put me into K-12 education. <laughs> okay. And we uh, grew up on the farm together, the children and I. And they now all have advanced degrees in science, engineering, or uh, medicine. One from, has a PhD from Caltech. Mm -hmm. But we, uh, we work in two major areas. One is in a specialized area of protein chemistry. They're little molecular clocks built into protein molecules, right. which we discovered a long time ago and we're the world's leading lab in developing the characteristics of those clocks. When you say in protein molecules, you're not talking about the telomeres on, on no, the no, genes. No, that's, that's DNA, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, the proteins are so, basically so you. So, you're built of protein. So, so. so proteins actually uh, wear out with these little clocks on oh, them? Oh, yeah, they wear out. In fact, okay. the clocks time how fast they wear out. Hmm. When the body makes a, uh, when your body makes thousands of these things to do everything okay. that uh, keeps you alive, and it decides at the time it makes it how long it's going to last. Hmm. You see that it's in a position kind of like an employer. You could hire an employee, but you can't tell what he's doing after you hire him. Right. So he goes out into that chemical environment in the cell, and it's, it's, it's a different environment for each protein, and some of them uh, need to be, rep the only way to solve this is to hire the employee and fire him after six months, you see. Right. Then you don't always have new ones. That's what proteins do. Uh, the DNA codes for the protein and it puts little clocks in it. Those little clocks gradually run out and when they change, they change the charge and the location in the protein. Mm -hmm. And when these charges change, it changes the structure of the protein and other proteins come along and gobble that one up. The body notices it needs more of that kind of protein, so it makes some more. Okay. They time various processes, but that's the simplest. So these clocks time how long proteins will live. The lenses in your eye, those mm -hmm. proteins are, that were there when you were a child. But of course, the things that digest your food are there for an hour, perhaps. Uh -huh. And most of the proteins live for 10, 20, 30 days, sometimes a little more. So those clocks, but the other thing that we specialize that's of greater interest is called metabolic profiling, it's diagnostic medicine. Now, we had the problem when Linus and I were working on this that we couldn't measure health quantitatively. We wanted graphs of your health versus what you ate, like how much vitamin. Mm -hmm. So if you had no vitamin, you had no health because you required for life. And as you ate more, your health increased. And then when you got too much, it starts to decrease again. Right. We couldn't draw the graphs because there's no, nothing to put on the side axis. We couldn't measure health quantitatively. So we got the idea that if we measured a very large number of metabolites, the quantities of a lot of the molecules, say 100 to 1,000 molecular weight in the person's body, uh, then we could do pattern recognition on them, and they would carry information about what was going on inside you. Mm -hmm. And we proved over the next 10 years that it works, but the technology was very difficult to do. We built a specialized lab for this. We had about a dozen scientists and engineers. And we proved that this hypothesis worked, but it was so impractical it couldn't be applied because you were too costly to, to, mm -hmm. to apply. So time passed, but about 10 years ago, uh, the technology for measurement took a very big leap forward. 
And then we added a lot to that technology. It's, mm -hmm. it's a special kind of mass spectrometry. So now we can measure 4,000 substances in a urine sample in two minutes. Mm -hmm. We can actually measure 30,000, but 4,000 are irrelevant. And uh, so you take a tiny dry drop of urine, you hit it with a laser, and uh, we measure peaks as low as 100 molecules to thousands of molecules. Yeah. So then we take uh, this information, mostly from the thousand most relevant chemical substances, mm -hmm. and we use mathematics on it. We published a paper in like last uh, year, for example, that showed that we could see impending heart attacks and impending breast cancer in people who had no symptoms and didn't know they had it. Right. And we're doing that because once the measurement technology was great, we, we asked for volunteers. We have 5,000 volunteers in Southern Oregon, mm -hmm. and they regularly send us urine samples, which we store cryogenically, and, and medical information. So in the case of those experiments, we found that there were a significant group of men and women who had had heart attacks after we stored their sample. Right. So we throw those samples out and see if we could have told what happened. And it's starting with those two diseases because they're prevalent. As you can see, the, the population of people who are ill with the illness would... Oh, yeah. Uh, so we're working on a little less prevalent illnesses now, and it'll go down to the very most rare illnesses as time passes. So we build this cryogenic bank, and then we measure it with these advanced techniques. And it's not just for diagnosis. Suppose you were ill, and say you've got cancer. Mm -hmm. And the doctor says, well, there are four or five things I could try, but this one I think is best. Well, if you have an axis that, tell, that you move along as you become better or worse for the disease, then you can watch where you are in that axis, and uh, if after he starts treating you, it slows down the process toward the wrong end, then you're happy. But if it doesn't slow down, you can go back and say, you know, this isn't working, let's try something else. Right. But the idea was to have something so inexpensive, this thing, we're not going to commercialize it, we do research, but commercialize five or ten dollars in analysis, which means you don't even have to go to the doctor to get, to keep track of yourself. Right. So that's our other interest, and we are the leading lab in that because we invented it long ago. Mm -hmm. And the uh, what are called magnetic resonance mass spectrometers is becoming incredible. When you put a urine sample in that thing, you get a lot of peaks that are smaller too that you can't, uh, you, not useful to you. Right. But you can see 200,000 different chemical substances just like that. It's amazing. There's a limit. The main limit is you can only put a million molecules in at a time. So you run it 30 or 40 times an average, and that's, mm -hmm. that's what we do. So we spend our time on that. We do a little work on nutrition and cancer because we always have. That's in mice, where mm -hmm. we vary their diet and, and look at the growth rate of cancer. Those are the three things we work on, and the first two are our main interests. And since we're all scientists, uh, my, my sons and daughters, we've all grown up together, and we still work together. And we have colleagues in other institutions. So that's what we are. Uh, we occasionally do something odd. Uh, during the Cold War, we stopped for six years and worked with the Reagan administration on civilian nuclear defense. Mm -hmm. And uh, did quite a bit with FEMA and the Oak Ridge National Lab. Fortunately, that wasn't necessary, but we, no one knew. Yeah. Uh, and then we've worked on some other scientific issues that uh, uh, affected human affairs. And then we got quite, we've gotten quite a bit into K through 12 education. It started with those six kids. Mm -hmm. I, I was an educator, but not K through 12. So uh, we developed curricula, and now they have about uh, 60,000 students around the world, around the country, public schools, private schools, and home schools, and we augment their curriculums and uh, improve their, their learning of the three R's. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a summary. Uh, the politics, <laughs> well, we uh, were fairly conservative, and we, uh, and, and we were delighted when we moved to Oregon 35 years ago. There, it seemed we got some money back from the legislature every year, you know, and it was uh, pretty good politics. But one day we went downtown uh, to a town hall by our congressman, and we, we th it wasn't our kind of guy. <laughs> So we uh, came back home, and I asked around, and I said, I hope they've got somebody who can beat him. And they said, well, the mayor of Springfield's running against him. We said, great, that's fine. Went back to our work. Well, my son Matthew was then a grad student in nuclear engineering at Oregon State. 
he calls me three days before the filing date and says, Dad, did you know the mayor of Springfield dropped out? <laughs> so we had a little meeting and said, well, we'll try it. And we entered a world that we didn't know anything about. Yeah. And we've run several times against Pete. We've gotten better every time. Uh, along the way, uh, we accidentally were elected chairman of the state party, so we did that too. But uh, we've been gaining on him, but he's a tough customer. He is uh, a wily uh, politician. Mm -hmm. uh, not always as principled as I was like, but he's uh, wily and difficult to beat. This last election, we uh, won the election in all five of the rural counties of District 4 mm -hmm. and the rural parts of Lane and Benton. But of course, the cities are different yeah. and Pete's very strong there and he's mm -hmm. still beating us because of that area. Mm -hmm. So we're running again in the primary because we have been getting more votes all the time and we have been uh, gaining on this guy. So uh, why throw that, that, that effort away? We're going to try to try to finish the job. I, I would say our chances might be 50-50. I mean, mm -hmm. Pete, Pete DeFazio it doesn't uh, do the things in Washington that I would prefer he did, uh, but he is a, an entrenched career politician, and he's tough to beat. So what are some of those things that you would like him to be doing? I <laughs> guess we get, you know, it's the issues is the next uh, Well, the, next the, uh, the biggest issue where we live was our timber industries. Right. Uh, the, in Josephine County, the last timber mill just closed. Right. Uh, we had a vibrant industry there, and our congressman didn't help us too much to keep it. Uh, the, uh, uh, so we've lost that industry, and uh, it's hard to replace. We have the finest trees in the world, but no timber industry. That's right. one problem. Uh, another problem is uh, uh, the Veterans Administration, uh, the uh, the veterans have some trouble uh, sometimes getting medical care at the VA. And uh, politicians, and he's not atypical, they tend to politic on problems instead of solving yeah. them. So for example, that problem, we promised the vets all the best medical care in the country as part of their right. service. And that's easy. Give them all the cards, say, that's, give that to any medical provider in the country, and that's it. It's simple to solve, but they don't solve it. Uh, they uh, instead, uh, every campaign they come and say they're going to fix the problems at the VA. And when veterans call with a problem, they, they help them. Yep. And this all helps to stay in office because you can give the speeches and you get the veterans to, uh, to like you because you helped this guy. I had a, one of my uh, friends who uh, helped on our campaign was a man named Harrison Schmidt. Harrison was the last man to land a vehicle on the surface of the moon, mm -hmm. but he's also a Caltech scientist. And Harrison was elected to the Senate for one term from New Mexico, and he told me when he was in the Senate, he was the only problem solver in the room. He said when a problem would come up, he'd suggest a solution. Now, he didn't say he was always right, he just yeah. would suggest a solution. And you know that, you're from MIT. Oh yeah. But he said the other 99 guys didn't want to solve the problem, they wanted to figure out how they could ride on the problem for political advantage. And this is a general problem. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the VA problem is trivial to solve, and yet it just festers because these guys want to ride on the problem instead of fixing it, where they get fixed with the card. Yeah. You got the card. You want to go to the VA if it's good enough, go. You want to go to the Mayo Clinic, well, show up. They pay it. All the bureaucracy goes away and nobody has any trouble. But that's the kind of thing they don't do. Right. And it needs to be done. Uh, an another, uh, another uh, problem. I'm an educator, and you know the Constitution does not give Congress any authority over the schools in the states. That's part of the Tenth Amendment. Mm -hmm. But they do have authority over the schools in D.C. Right. They run those. 50,000 students, 67 percent are black, and most of them can't read when they graduate from high school. Not it's a, a bad good example. Problem. Yeah. And what needs to be done is Congress needs to go in there get rid of all the bureaucrats, some of them may be good, but just get rid of them, keep the best teachers, hire more best teachers, do whatever you have to do to finance it, and make those schools the best in the country. Then they could serve as an example. Yeah. They don't have a right to go over to Virginia and tell them to run the schools, but if they would make those D.C. schools the terrific, it would serve as an example to the states. 
that's something one congressman could do because most of them don't care about the problem. Right. And that's one thing I've, I've uh, been eyeing. The other thing I look at is that there's only one scientist in the whole Congress, and uh, he has a little different views than I do. I think they need to be more scientists in the Congress, and I think, I thought when we started out, the main interest we had was in science issues that affected human affairs. I thought that that kind of reasoning, you could go up there at your mm -hmm. office, hold little seminars for the other congressmen, and make it more, make them understand the quantitative aspects of what they were doing a little better. Uh, this experience in politics has made me understand that there are other difficulties. <laughs> oh, yeah. And uh, so the political process is very complicated. Uh, it's not something a scientist uh, is trained for. But we got into this, and we think we can eventually uh, retire Pete, so we're trying to do it. Still at it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess the perspective on, on science, I think, is, is pretty good. And, and your point on there not being enough scientists in Congress is well taken. And engineers, too. You know, mm -hmm. where there's a whole different, uh, well, just sort of STEM fields in general. Your mm -hmm. science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. People who've, uh, it's a very different worldview. Yes. And especially now, I mean, as, as uh, things have changed, there's, um, the whole postmodernist thing, which is being taught at universities mm -hmm. um, in the non-STEM subjects, yeah. and are trying to get distribution classes forced onto people in the mm -hmm. in the STEM subjects. Yeah. Uh, whereas uh, the science is the science subjects are still taught with a philosophic positivism. Uh, modernism uh, mm -hmm. approach underneath it that there is a knowable physical reality yeah. and and we can discover what that is and you know based on that knowledge we can do good things and if you have enough humility yeah. which you have to have if you have enough humility to understand how far you can go mm -hmm. you can actually establish truths that are useful to people All right that's why science feeds engineering because a machine of course has to be correct or it doesn't work yeah, I mean, if if you think about something like quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. I mean, what was what's the probability that somebody could stumble across a, a concept like a transistor? Yeah, you know, That's it's right. you might have you might have come across a you know a PN junction in you know at some point, mm -hmm. but um, you wouldn't really understand it without quantum mechanics. Yeah. But to put the third junction together. Uh, mm -hmm. with that uh, is you know and to understand what it's about yeah. just wouldn't happen and that's the basis for all of computers yeah. uh, probably the most lucrative industry that's ever existed mm -hmm. you know in the history of the planet yeah. um, the whole information technology yeah. we did some basic science Linus and I published a little bit of stuff on nuclear physics but mm -hmm. our field was primarily chemistry and biology and chemistry is not an exact science as physics, mm -hmm. but it's fairly exact. Biology is very inexact because the system is so complicated. Right. And you do mostly empirical work. But if you're careful, you don't make mistakes. But you have to be very careful yeah. and not uh, ask questions that you can't answer. Or if you a give an answer, it's possibly incorrect uh, because it's, I mean, We've only barely scratched the surface of biochemistry. Right. But you can do things, like I was talking about, this empirical work on urine. We're not even understanding why those patterns are there. We're just finding useful things. Right. And you can do that kind of work and improve human life. Uh, understanding at the level of physics for biochemistry is probably centuries away. Yeah, I mean, under, under physics, you can establish laws, That's things right. that happen all the time. Right. You go up a level to chemistry, you can sort of establish principles. <laughs> That's right. And then you can get up to rules, and, and it becomes, yeah. uh, you know, more, more yeah. every, every level of abstraction That's you go right. up, there's more exceptions. But physics is a lot of fun because yeah. it's, it is exact. And there are aspects of chemistry that I've always enjoyed. Uh, I don't do much biology, but most of the, actually most of the discoveries in biology were made by physicists mm -hmm. and chemists, yeah. and a lot of them by physicists because they thought differently. Yeah. Uh, the, and one of the things that uh, my uh, senior scientist that trained me said, uh, if you enter a new field, don't read anything. Because if you read the literature, you'll go down the same path everybody else did. Yeah. If you enter a new field, the idea is that you have something different to offer. 
So mm -hmm. study the field on your own for a year or so, and then read what everybody else is doing. It's uh, And a lot of really good things have been published by guys like Feynman. And oh, yeah. Poling was a, uh, a genius at simplification. Mm -hmm. It just maddened <laughs> his, his colleagues because he would empirically simplify th something, yeah. uh, not to claim to understand it, just simplify it. Like he simplified the understanding of the chemical bond right. at a time when we didn't have computers. So we couldn't use molecular orbital theory. We just had this simple model. There's a model you could carry in your head and do a lot of chemistry. Mm -hmm. uh, Gradually, it was replaced by computer models, which are very powerful. But still, it's nice to carry it in your head as well as being able to go over and have. You got to watch out; computers can can get away from you. The statistics doesn't lie, but you better do it carefully, or you'll make mistakes. <laughs> so, I guess I guess on the subject of computers getting away from you, yeah, uh, just out of interest, when do you think the self-aware machine intelligence is going to happen? I don't know. Uh, you know, it's out of any, my field. Any, it makes great science fiction, any, but it's the machines are very powerful. I don't know. You see these prognostications by people in the field or physics yeah. people, and we use computers, of course, in everything we do. Oh yeah. But I, I don't know whether these statements they're making about the rivalry of, with the human brain are fictional or has some merit. I just yeah. don't know that. Yeah, I, I read a. I read Kurzweil's book some time ago, and he was predicting by 2019, which I thought was a bit optimistic. That's a little different. I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah. So I'm I'm yeah. sort of I'm sort of in the you know 20 early 2030s, mm -hmm. but you know could be surprised it might happen before yeah. some Uber car is going to be driving itself and have to make <laughs> a decision and go wait a second why am I doing this? <laughs> well, it's it's clear that these machines are a tremendous blessing to the human race. Yeah. And we will have to learn to live with their capabilities. Yep. And we already have the problem of the information capabilities, with mm -hmm. the, like this Facebook complication. Oh, yeah. And you can't keep that stuff for a secret. Everybody can crack anything on the Internet. So we have now the ability to con communicate with, all, with each other all over the world instantly. Yep. We have massive data uh, storage. And that can be helpful, but also it, when it interfaces with human life, uh, it's, it's different. Yeah, I mean, essentially, you know, taking Facebook, and they're, yeah. they're in trouble at this point. Oh, yeah. It's interesting because um, they're in trouble for a company that did exactly what the Obama administration exactly. did. Okay, exactly. Exactly. So it wasn't a problem yeah. when the Obama administration did it, but now yeah. it's a problem when the Republicans are doing well, it. Well, and Pete's been pacing me because I used that company a little bit. <laughs> they came in. In 2014, uh, this was a British company which was famous for targeting. And you understand in politics, targeting okay. goes back to mail oh, targeting. Yeah. Uh, learning about the voter so that you can speak to him yep. about the things he wants is as old as politics. And uh, this company was a world company out of Britain that was famous for its capabilities. Uh, most of the work it was doing was with scientists at Cambridge University. And they decided that they would come to the United States in 2014 and see if they could help Republicans. Mm -hmm. So they formed an American company, came in. And as far as I know, they didn't have any Facebook beta. I never saw or heard of any of it. But apparently in 2016, at least the contractor they had did have Facebook data, right. and that was helpful to the Trump campaign. But as you mentioned, the elephant in the room is Zuckerberg gave the entire Facebook file to Obama in 2012, and he still has it. Yep. And the power of that is immense because when you individually, um, that's what they do. I'm, yep. I don't, I'm sorry to They're talk selling about ads. They're selling when, ads. When you individually talk, well, the commercial parameters. Now look for something on Craigslist, and you will suddenly have ads on your computer for the next week. Yep. So they're targeting. Uh, but you target individuals. That's what they've done. You know, mm -hmm. learn more about the individual, what he's interested in, and then campaign to him for his politics. What the dimension Facebook added was just a new dimension. You know who his friends and relatives are, and you know how to talk to them. Yep. So you go to a major supporter of yours, you know that from Facebook, and you say, the things you need to say to these two relatives of yours and this friend of yours are the following. Yeah. And we have determined that those two people are movable to our side. So you now the, the people in Facebook themselves become the tool that you talk to the other people with.
Yeah. This dimension is powerful beyond comprehension because now it isn't some, some candidate talking to somebody and trying to convince them. It's their friend. It's yeah. their relative. And you've, you've analyzed them all and you've figured out how they're going to interact. Yeah, you can, you can establish networks to, uh, right. to push your point. So these people, uh, Obama had it all, and it's very possible that Romney lost that election because of it. Uh, when yeah. I was chairman of the state party, I, we didn't know anything about Facebook, yeah. but Reince Priebus was spending $30 million in Silicon Valley trying to build something that would match the Democrat computers. And it was well known that Demo Obama just had incredible computer capability, and we were wiped out. Yeah. Well, he built that, and then the only data they had to put in it was uh, uh, old walk data from people who met them at their doors. So it's still very primitive, and Obama had the whole Facebook file. Yeah. So, uh, and I know that in 2014, I don't think anybody, including the, the, the people at Cambridge, had uh, the fa Well, they apparently had Facebook but at Cambridge, but it wasn't being used in politics. Mm -hmm. But in 2016, it was used by the Trump campaign. And, of course, uh, there's a part of our society that is very angry that Trump was elected. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and yes. so they go after everything that helped him. Well, they, they don't seem to realize how bad a candidate they put up against Trump. I That's mean, right. You know, for, for disclosure, I've, I've said this in several of the interviews. Um, I'm, I'm lean left, mm -hmm. fairly solidly left. And uh, so my history is I voted... Starting in 1972 with uh, McGovern and uh, Nixon, I voted for McGovern. Yeah. So I voted um, 11 times for a Democrat, twice for Ralph Nader, mm -hmm. and in this election, I voted for Trump. And mm -hmm. people are yeah. not happy about that. Well, it's a lot of huge nastiness for well, for simply saying that I could not stomach Hillary and I could not stomach what her campaign had done. One of the men I know who yeah. understands that very thoroughly was involved in it very deeply. Put it this way: He said. The election outcome, the most important thing in the outcome was Hillary Clinton. Yeah. The second most important was the president. And then we get down to the uh, skill with which people targeted particular states and so forth. So yeah. the skillful campaigning, especially at the last, was important. But the most important factor was Hillary. Yeah. As you said, you just said it. Yep. She, uh, you know, I, I remember looking at all the polling data and going, this just can't be right. Mm -hmm. You know, Trump was filling these um, stadiums of 50, 60, 80,000 yeah, people, yeah. and Hillary couldn't fill a town hall meeting I with know. 200. And, she, and they're saying she's ahead. It's like, excuse me? I don't <laughs> think so. Well, and people, people are yeah. unhappy about things that have oh, happened. Yeah. And uh, uh, the president speaks to them in their own language. He speaks to them in the language that people use when they're watch, drinking beer and watching television. Yeah. There's no, what would a fact checker look like it, with a bunch of guys drinking beer watching television? Well, yeah. of course, it's not rigorous. It's just the way Americans talk to each other. He's talking to them this way, and it works because they understand it. And you're talking to a guy, they always talk about Trump as a, a reality show star. Yeah. This guy built skyscrapers in New York City. Mm -hmm. New York City is the toughest, I mean, it's just unbelievable tough place. And anybody can build a skyscraper in New York City, you want to have on your side. I mean, yeah. It's a really tough thing to do. Yeah, I'm, I'm sort of watching the deep state kind of unravel. Mm -hmm. um, it's been slow, it's been frustrating, um, but, uh, you know, Comey, the, the public has sort of rejected Comey and his explanation. Mm -hmm. They were interested because they thought he might have the magic bullet that's going to kill Trump, mm -hmm. but he doesn't. Yeah. And I'm not convinced that that bullet exists. I mean, after the time mm -hmm. that they've been, that they've been fought, they've been going after him, it just plain doesn't yeah. exist. And you know, you you mentioned you're leaning. I kind of yeah. lean conservative, but actually, we meet in the same place because what we want is American freedom. Yeah. Uh, our country was built by some men who tried to protect our freedoms. Mm -hmm. That's what the Constitution was about. Yeah. And uh, uh, it has been hurt primarily by the diminution of American freedom yeah, on I, both the left and the right. Oh, absolutely. And so this whole thing st starts to congeal where the people who are manipulating the America, the, me the media is very furious, of course, because mm -hmm. they think it's their privilege to tell us what to think. And uh, it's, it's, it's growing and the principal people on both the left and the right have the same goal. Yeah. Freedom. 
You know, I, I look at I look at myself as a a, a classic liberal, mm -hmm. an Enlightenment liberal. You know, all of those principles that that um, you, you know were sort of the English school of philosophy, mm -hmm. um, and then the Counter Enlightenment splits off with Kant, mm -hmm. um, and it changes the nature. I mean, Kant's whole goal was to reestablish the existence of God. Mm -hmm. Okay, so he had, in order to do that, he had to attack reason as a useful tool in determining reality, right. and also our senses is doing that. And mm -hmm. and we could go through the arguments yeah. that were made and that kind of thing, but they were sort of accepted. And then he substituted in this concept: well, if you feel it really strongly, then you know, therefore, if I feel something is true, then it is true, <laughs> which is kind which, of a, a play on Rousseau, only a different <laughs> issue. <laughs> yeah, it really is, and and that's the thing that's that's mm -hmm. under underpins the German school of philosophy, yeah. which ultimately brought us World War One and World War Two. Yeah, and one brought us two, and one was unnecessary. Yeah, it's uh, 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 people. You have to respect human life. That's really the greatest gift we have. Yeah. But uh, people are funny, and they do irresponsible things. Yeah. Uh, they tried to. Interestingly, they uh, they won the Revolutionary War and didn't have a constitutional convention for ten years. Mm -hmm. They got to worrying that things might go bad, well, <laughs> and they, got back together to try to fix it. Well, they 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 started out with something that they thought would work, but didn't. Yeah. And then they were sort of forced into a better structure because mm -hmm. all of the kinds of um, you know, it, it's things like in order to organize a society, there are certain rules you have to mm -hmm. have to have, and the, right. the rule set in the Articles of Confederation was not sufficient. Yeah, that's right. And they lived in their time, yeah. so there were some rules they wanted to make they couldn't make. Absolutely, slavery was a big issue. And the, for many the Revolutionary people. War had one perverse goal uh, result. Uh, England flee, freed the slaves in all of their colonies, yeah. but we had broken from England, so it didn't happen for us. <laughs> it's yeah. it's, it's uh, uh, history, human affairs, they're remarkable, but we're in it. Yeah. And if we have a chance to contribute a little bit in our time, we should. We're all just little bit players in this, you know, but it's... Oh, yeah. it's uh, it, anyway, it, it caught... We, we, as I say, stumbled in, the way I told you, into the politics. We've okay. done things that were political, but it's like science. We were doing engineering work on nuclear defense mm -hmm. in the Cold War, but uh, we stumbled into the political arena not knowing what we were doing. We, I was telling the voters that I, I was going to have seminars on scientific issues for mm -hmm. congressmen so they would know more. That's, this, yeah. is my, <laughs> this is why. And, of course, it's much more complicated and mm -hmm. much, more, uh, uh, much more difficult. But... Uh, I think if you stumble into a place where you think you can do something worthwhile, you should bloom where you are and try. Yeah. And we succeeded a few things, so we're still working on Mr. DeFazio, and of course he's working on us. So. Yeah. So let's, uh, okay, you mentioned uh, basically three issues, timber veterans and education. As examples. Um, you know, and you're bringing up the, the thing about science. Yeah. Um, the other, you want me to bring up another one? Go for it. Okay. Well, you know, we're in bad financial trouble. Oh, yeah. the, the debt is unpayable. The unfunded liabilities make it astronomic. Yep. And our country is going to go through something with relation to that debt. Oh, yeah. And you know people have different hypotheses about what it'll be, but it's something. Well, well the interesting... And we need... Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, the interesting thing about a lot of that is you go back to 1913 when the Fed was established. That, that, that's right. Woodrow okay. Wilson. I mean, yeah, and not only, not only did Wilson allow the Fed but allowed the income tax That's because right. there is a question as to whether the mm -hmm. third uh, the um, 19th amendment was actually even ratified yep. and it was just kind of uh, apparently Wilson had cut a deal with you know the mm -hmm. sort of new world order of its time yeah. and that uh, they would support him if he let him get those two things yeah. and so um, it was kind of the uh, lame duck Taft administration where we can sort of throw these in and then if Wilson doesn't complain, there they are, they stick. But we didn't have to borrow our, our money supply. We could have, you know, spent it into existence right. and avoided this entire disaster. Yeah. But now the question is what do you do? There you go. And uh, I think it's clear, you, you probably know all the different scenarios, but uh, how do we preserve the main 
uh, functions of our government and the things our society needs the most mm -hmm. while it's happening. Right. Because there will be a reduction in what can be spent. And we have to defend the country. That's in yep. the Constitution. We have to do our best in Social Security and medical care because mm -hmm. those hundreds of millions of Americans are depending on it. So you have to preserve Social Security, you have to preserve Medicare, you have to preserve defense, and then you have to look at everything else and start figuring out what we can do without as we mm. get through that problem. Yeah. And that's the main problem that will be f before Congress. And of course, you can say, like the schools I mentioned, nobody in Congress cares about those schools, they'd probably give them to me and let me do it. Yeah. <laughs> but on these bigger issues, you're one vote in the room and uh, trying to convince your colleagues. And there, there you cannot represent that you can fix the problems. You can represent that you think you have a philosophical attitude toward the problems that would be useful. Mm -hmm. At the same time, as they affect your district, like in this case District 4, your obligation is to use the position to help the people in District 4 the most. That was the idea. There are individual representatives for groups yeah. of people. So you have to help your district with their particular problems, and you have to, with these existential problems in the government, you have to do your best and have your head screwed on right, and maybe some wisdom. Yeah. And then uh, if you want to pick a particular project, one congressman, um, he might pick one or two, but you're only one man. Yeah. And uh, I've always been interested in energy, so I, I, mm -hmm. uh, I like that, but that's a, big, a bigger problem. And, uh, um, well, where, where should we go with energy? I well, mean, I know where we're going in the, in the near term. Yeah. Uh, seven billion people depend on hydrocarbons to keep them alive. Oh, yeah. So, w w with hydrocarbon energy. Uh, and, there's an, and there's an infinite supply because the methylene class rates in the ocean are greater in abundance than all the coal, oil, and natural gas on Earth. So there's no fundamental limit in supply, but there is a limit in supply at each price. Right. So that... Uh, regardless of what you liked, with seven billion people running machines that keep them alive, you got to keep feeding the machines. Right. The long term, uh, most scholars that I respect in this say that the human race will switch to nuclear energy. And, uh, and the United States started down that path mm -hmm. and then politically stopped it. Well, it's, yeah. it started down and it really didn't behave itself very well in the early years. Well, it, it didn't, uh, we didn't have, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission ran it, yeah. and it avoided serious accidents. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but, it's, but just, sort of just barely. Uh, well, I mean, we're talking, we got there. we're talking with the smaller, you know, yeah. I mean, the, the smaller systems that were being built in the 50s and early yeah. 60s before you really got to the sort of no, giga I, plants. All, any advance in technology yeah. has bad things and good things. Oh, yeah. You know that. And of course, but if you have a, a, a methodology that can make electricity at two cents a kilowatt hour and you're competing with, against it with something that takes 10 or 15 cents, you've got a problem. Yeah. So right now in Asia, Throughout Asia, China, and so forth, they're beginning to build a huge nuclear power industry. Mm -hmm. Our industries are, a lot of them are in Asia now. We'd like to bring them back. Oh, yeah. And there are, there are systematic reasons why they went to Asia. Mm -hmm. But if we face a future that I won't see, you know, and, uh, yeah. because it's later, if we face a future where Asia and Africa are powered by two cent an hour power, and we are powered by 15 cents, they won't come back because right. energy is, a tech, is the currency of technological progress. So there's been a tremendous amount of advance in nuclear energy, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, and, and so I, I believe that we must do everything we can to keep our hydrocarbons going because the people have to have them now. Yeah. And I believe the long-term future of our country depends on using the best technology and whatever its problems are, there's so much energy per unit cost in the in the advance that we must join it in some way. The um, yeah, in terms in terms of the whole nuclear thing, I mean, there's the whole thorium question as a cycle. There's mm -hmm. yeah, I uh, but but if you start 
talking about this kind of stuff. There is so it's much not, negativity. That's in right. This I talked about it just now. Yeah. And I know it's not politically correct to talk about. It. It's it's a problem. That's I think political correctness is a serious problem. Yes. Often by itself that's because right. it shuts down discussion. That's right. Every time in a society, I mean, you can look throughout <laughs> history. Um, the Middle East had, you know, after mm -hmm. the fall of Rome, the Middle East science sort of continued a little bit for a while mm -hmm. until um, Islam took over mm -hmm. and said, oh no, you can't talk about this anymore. Mm -hmm. So as soon as they shut down free speech, so it was, you know, around 1000 AD, yeah. uh, that was the end of science in the Middle East. But energy, uh, it's another issue in freedom. Now, since yeah. energy is dangerous, or <laughs> if you have a lot of it in one yeah. place, it sure is, uh, you must have oversight. You must be careful. Right. But you must be careful. And at the same time, you must allow it as much freedom as possible because it won't advance either unless you right. have free competition. Uh, solar power, for example, is very useful for certain things, diffuse power needs. Mm -hmm. And uh, you shouldn't be manipulating that stuff. Just uh, my feeling is we shouldn't have the regulations Everybody should be buying their solar powers, their solar panels at Home Depot and put them on their roofs yeah. because it's, it, it wouldn't be hard. But there's a lot of regulatory things that have. So we had solar power coming along and uh, advancing. You know, a lot of things were being done in the engineering. And so it was promoted by those who felt it was useful, but they promoted it and added a huge government element to it. Right. Now the solar panels are dirt cheap. But the government element is still there. Yep. There was there was a lot of stuff around. During the 70s, we had a fairly nicely growing solar industry, yeah. and then they got into this discussion. The the I'm going to uh, use the phrase the powers that be mm -hmm. found a very creative way to kill it, yes. and mm -hmm. that way was to uh, talk about tax incentives, mm -hmm. and so uh, while we were ha while the tax incentives were all in the future. People stopped buying because they were waiting for those to come <laughs> yeah, into. That happened. And and they wiped out a a very nicely growing yeah. solar industry. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so most of those companies went out of existence. And then, when it did, when the tax stuff came into existence, it mm. was really sucked up by some of the larger. Uh, uh, oil industry. I mean, mm. Mobile sucked a lot of that money, yeah. various other uh, large corporations, and it was huge nastiness which gave the whole industry mm. a bad name. That's right. And, you know, kind of killed it for a long time. Well, you know, I've, I've, uh, we've done yeah. quite a few things uh, which are beneficial to the hybrid carbon industry. We don't get any money from them, but we've been in this global warming fight and stuff. And, uh, uh, but when you get these big industries and you get an institution like the U.S. Congress where you can buy influence, you can compete uh, for a congressman rather than the marketplace, things change. I don't know the details, but I'll bet you, and you mentioned one, I'll bet you there are several poor turns in our energy system that were caused by the major industry wanting preference. Yeah. In, in other and words, that if happened in, nuclear, in, in solar energy. Yeah. If you're if you're big enough that you can alter your marketplace, yep. but I don't I don't think that the solar energy industry was big enough to do that. No. But it did. But it did get some political allies who I think um, you know as you as you yeah. point out in terms of the government component, uh, really hamstrung it. Yeah. Just, just ask the question. Yeah. Why aren't the American people buying those things at Home Depot and putting them on their roofs? Right. They're beneficial to put on the roof of a house. That's not, you're not going to refine steel with it, but as a fuse power, it's very useful. Yeah. But we've got all of this impediments, all of this uh, diminution of freedom. Regulation, yeah. And that uh, prevents the advance. Mm -hmm. If you let the advance go, uh, people will start doing whatever is most cost effective for them. Yeah. And there are other things, you, these windmills. Well, if, if there weren't any subsidies and people could decide whether they want a windmill or solar power, you, you, you'd probably find out what worked. Well, around here, uh, specifically in the greater Eugene Springfield mm -hmm. area, um, windmills won't work because the of average course. wind speed is too low. Yeah. I mean, there's some areas like there's that little uh, section to the south mm -hmm. where the Willamette Valley sort of narrows. Mm -hmm. You got something up there, you go out to the shoreline, yeah. you've got something along some of the crests of, of the hills you do. But the intermittentness causes yeah. you to have to build gas plants beside them. Right. Uh, and the maintenance problem is still coming because it's a lot of mechanical equipment. 
So we really, uh, uh, it's, it's, it's been, as you say, that industry has been pushed by government possibly into uh, a partial dead end yeah. because of what they did. Uh, you can't build nuclear power plants in your backyard or let people do this when three of my children are educated yeah. in nuclear engineering. Mm -hmm. And you can't build those in your backyard. You have to have oversight. Uh, but they're very useful. Uh, hydrocarbons are similar, of course. You, you might have a gas well in your backyard, but it's unusual. <laughs> so, uh, but you use it for what it is. I, I mentioned our our 5,000-person cryogenic urine bank. Mm -hmm. Well, we can't afford those for those freezers to ever go off. Right. So they're on the grid. They got backup diesel, and then we put enough solar power so we can run them that way. Mm -hmm. Then we know we'll always be able to keep our freezers running. And our mass spectrometer depends on a, uh, a, a uh, superconducting magnet mm -hmm. sitting there in 75 gallons of liquid helium, and it can't ever go off right. because it's, it's, it's too delicate. So the same thing. We've got solar panels to back it up. So there, they aren't necessarily practical economically where we are, yeah. but they're infinitely practical because the sun's not going to not come up. <laughs> no, I, I agree. You know, here's where, here's where we can, you know, place a little bit of blame. I think uh, Reagan, uh, one, of the, one of the early things that he did was he zeroed DARPA's budget because they were going to buy solar panels for the er distant early warning, the dew line up in Alaska. Is that right? I didn't know that. It turns out that, uh, well, Alaska gets sunlight for six months. Yeah. And so for the summer, it's far cheaper to put in, or even back in the, in the 70s and early 80s, it was far cheaper to, uh, even at market prices as they were at the time, mm -hmm. to put in uh, solar cells over the summer and then run diesel generators I over see. the winter. Yeah. And so they put out uh, these huge you know, requests for bids. And uh, uh, when Reagan came in, he zeroed them out and said, uh, specifically, the government should not pick winners and losers in the mm -hmm. marketplace. Yeah. That, um, had he gotten into office in 76, mm -hmm. um, he, and, and zero DARPA, the internet might not exist. Mm -hmm. Because DARPA was enforcing a routable protocol mm -hmm. of which TCP IP mm -hmm. was the only one that, that was sort of in existence at the time. Every other company had their own uh, protocol. I mean, there was mm -hmm. Token Ring, there was XNS, there was NetBuoy, you know, the mm -hmm. list goes on and on. And mm -hmm. without DARPA enforcing TCP IP, the internet might and not And none of that existed. really opposed any danger. Yeah. The, uh, whenever you fiddle with human freedom, mm -hmm. uh, you can make mistakes. Yep. And he understood freedom, but that didn't mean he couldn't make mistakes. Yeah. And when you're given government power, your mistakes, that's why they build a federal system. The idea is 50 states are going to do different things and watch each other, you know. Yeah. But the federal government has gotten into a lot of things it doesn't belong in. I'm, I'm, and I'm the, inclined to agree with that. And that's... That's really the driving force in most of the people that I have constituents that help me in campaigns. Yeah. We talk about that. We, uh, of course, we may, the examples we use are more toward the conservative side. Mm -hmm. But I can create the whole examples on the liberal side, too. Yeah. The diminution of freedom. Freedom built the greatest uh, miracle of, of, of a country in the world. And diminution of freedom has slowed it down a lot, and it's causing a lot of trouble for all of us. Well, well a lot of people <coughs> on, the, on the extreme left at this point don't view the United States as a good. Mm -hmm. They view it as an evil. Yeah. And, you know, there's, there's an opposition. I mean, a lot of it is uh, the Marxists waiting for the collapse mm -hmm. of capitalism, yeah. which I don't think is going to happen, no. okay, because capitalism has, um, cre you know, has created a staggering amount of wealth and distributed it reasonably evenly, although as of late, I think the concentration of wealth is, you know, Bernie was talking about that, Trump was talking about that. Mm -hmm. But the, so there's the a lot Fed of people. Is, and the Fed is printing the money to make it possible. Yeah. <laughs> so. so, but the, um, um, the issue is that uh, you have to essentially deal with the problems of the working class or you're going to get yeah. um, some kind of a revolution yeah. and, and I would, revolutions are messy. And they don't come out right. Most of them don't, don't come out come right. Don't come out right. You don't want that. Yeah. Uh, because uh, then it's, it's 
just the luck of the draw, whether you get something useful out of it. Mm -hmm. That our country was born in a revolution that worked is pretty unusual. Yep. Then they tried the French Revolution. <laughs> well, so. the French Revolution sort of went on, you know, it was kind of, I mean, philosophically, um, it was the Lockeans who ran the first two mm -hmm. phases, yeah. and then when the Rousseauans, Rousseauans, or however you want to pronounce it, uh, took over, that's when the reign of terror began. Of course, the mob. Yeah. And uh, you can always create a mob of humans. It's not, it's not a good characteristic, but yeah. it's there. And, I, and I, I think that the current media is creating mobs. That's what they're doing, and it's yeah. very dangerous. It's, it's extremely uh, dangerous. dangerous. The the uh, that in the Constitutional Convention, those guys kept talking about how they didn't want a democracy, yeah. because democracy fifty one percent can seize the property and lives of the forty nine. You understand the problem, oh, yeah. and uh, uh, we we have a, a thing now where people really believe that if they get fifty one percent of the vote, they can do anything they want to you. So where are your rights? Yeah, uh, and uh, I I watch. Things happen in our country, and things our country does, and the things that bother me. Yeah. And uh, the list includes a lot of things that your side doesn't want to see, as well as the things I don't want to see. Yeah. I mean, it's not. And the people are upset about it. And maybe we're seeing more of this Marxism. Didn't we see a lot of that in the Depression, too? When things aren't going yeah. well, you, you have more, it gets more traction. Well, you know, I sort of look at you know, Roosevelt, and the question is, if you, if you, ask, if you ask what brought about the Great Depression, mm -hmm. okay, um, there's, this, there's this discussion about speculation in the stock market, mm -hmm. okay, well that doesn't really answer anything, mm -hmm. because it, the stock market is just determining who owns things. That's right. It's because, but it doesn't make the plant vaporize or disappear no. or drop no. into the just twilight Just decides zone. who owns it. Just decides who owns it. Yeah. And so the problem in then was the issue that working people didn't have any money, yeah. okay, which means demand collapses mm -hmm. because demand requires two things, the desire to buy and the ability to pay. Yeah. If you don't have the ability to pay, you yeah. can desire all you want, right. but, but yep. people aren't going to mm -hmm. be able to produce stuff because right. nobody's going to be able to consume it. Yeah. And so you spiral down as, as more people get you know, laid off, then the company mm -hmm. can't produce the stuff that they were normally buying, so yeah. more layoffs, more closures, yeah. and we go down. Now, um, I think that Roosevelt was sort of dragged into, you know, as they say, you know, America will eventually do the right thing after it tries <laughs> everything else. Yes. Uh -huh. um, you know, sort of looked at, at limiting the concentration of wealth, and that's mm -hmm. where the heavily graduated income tax came. Mm -hmm. And it did have the effect of, um, we almost got part of that. Almost got us, and then and then the, def, the sort of Keynesian definite uh, deficit spending to try to re-stimulate the economy, mm -hmm. and we almost got out in '37, and then the Fed tightened the money supply and pushed us right mm -hmm. back in, and so it was World War II that, that the spending mm -hmm. for World War II that yeah. brought us out of it. But the issue was dealing with the concentration of wealth, mm -hmm. and by in during the Great Depression there were a number of billionaires by. Uh, the 1950s, there mm -hmm. were zero left, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that th that we have now taken basically 75 years and disassembled all of those things that do limit concentration mm -hmm. of wealth and power. Yeah, and this financialization now is not centered individuals but institutions. Yeah, uh, banks have enormous power. Mm -hmm. I'm not just pavlovianly against banks, but the power the economic power yeah. that they've assembled, but that power depends on printing money. <laughs> yeah, it does. And that doesn't work forever. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, you need freedom there. Uh, the Constitution had something to say about the money. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other options. People like Kublai Khan uh, started the paper money game. <laughs> but uh, why not have freedom there? Yeah. Use a medium of exchange you like. And don't tax one of them so you can't use it. So we got about four minutes left. Um, we, we can tackle a, a subject that we've uh, gone on a little bit, or you can add a little bit. Um, Why don't you decide what we should use the four minutes um, for? Yeah, I guess, uh, well, first, a uh, couple of, of sort of housekeeping questions. I assume you have a, a web page that yeah. people should yeah, go we visit. we have a Facebook page and an yeah. internet page, and then 
So what, another, do, you, do you know, remember the URLs? Oh, uh, RobinsonforCongress.com. RobinsonforCongress.com. And, uh, and then there's one that looks like us. Pete created it. <laughs> <laughs> and he tells what we really like, according to him. Uh, so see. there's several web pages. Okay. Uh, and uh, but our pages are the usual ones, a Facebook page and a thing, and you put Art Robinson in, you get them. Uh, we, uh, right now, we, we've made a lot of progress, and we're trying to convince the Republicans that we should be allowed to continue that progress. Mm. And there's a primary. Yeah. So, and I've, I've won several primaries, but I have four opponents that are, they'd all be credible congressmen. Mm -hmm. So we have to see what happens. Yeah, it's a big, it's a big field, but... Uh, yeah. So, okay. So about three minutes left. Um, I don't know. Let's. Uh, I actually, initially, I I met you briefly. You know, this is several years ago mm -hmm. uh, when you were, I think, first running against uh, Pete Tafazio. Yeah. I went to your town meeting or town hall or whatever you want to call I it see. at uh, Valley River. Oh yes. And. Yeah, I one of the things was was the climate change thing, because yeah. uh, you, I guess, had written a, you and one of your sons had written a paper on climate right. change. So and we went on to get thirty one thousand scientists to sign up on our side. That's yeah. been a kind of a bone of contention. Mm -hmm. People that don't like us. Yeah. So I, you know, it, I, I actually read the paper. I, you know, got a copy oh, from you and and read the thing. Um, and I guess mostly it was you were looking at sort of the output of the sun specifically. Well, we, we were looking at all the empirical things. Like yeah. if you say that the sea level is rising, you make a graph of sea level rise. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you say the glaciers are shrinking, you make a graph of sea level shrinking. Yeah. There are some uh, scientific aspects to it. Uh, an important one is the correlation between CO2 and temperature. Right. And that correlation is based on Beer's law. There's a certain... Uh, the temperature over any solution determines the vapor pressure of the things in the, mm -hmm. the gas phase. And these, uh, these uh, graphs from the ice core data right. are perfect. Uh, the laboratory shows what the vapor pressures are, and they're exactly what they should be, because mm -hmm. the system apparently approximates equilibrium on geological fines. So when you go out and say, well, it goes up and down with temperature, it does. But that's a physical chem chemical phenomenon. It isn't a causative commodity. And even uh, I knew I knew Hans Seuss and uh, William Nuremberg that worked with Ravel in La Jolla. I was a, I was on the faculty there then. Yeah. And uh, they all concluded that uh, it was a real phenomenon, but it wasn't harmful because it was a small phenomenon. Uh, and they, and that's on the basis of this empirical evidence. Uh, there's a great but, disagreement about this. Yeah, but we are, we are so empirical evidence, we have science, uh, satellite data, for example, yeah. on the Arctic and that, uh, melting. Right. So I guess the question is, why is it melting now? Well, uh, if you yeah. look at the historical record, it comes and goes. Well, it's been pretty solidly blocked for 12 million years. Uh, no, the, the the temperature of the Earth. And oh yeah, that, uh, going that, up. but I'm talking about the, the Arctic record. being frozen. Uh, but we're going to we're probably going to have to leave it yeah. leave it here. It was uh, late to start this in the discussion, yeah. but uh, I want to thank you for the uh, for the well, conversation. It was very much. very enjoyable, and I wish you the best on your campaign. We'll, we'll see what happens, and uh, we will see folks again on the next interview.